Welcome everyone to Work Without Limits 2020. I am so pleased to be here with David Henshaw, the CEO of Citrix. We are here to talk about leadership in a remote first world. David, welcome. My first question for you is really about understanding how this has all impacted Citrix. We are in the middle of a remote work first experiment for so many companies, and I'm wondering if you can tell us what's been going on for you, for your teams, for your customers, Give us a little bit of a state of play on the ground. Well, thanks, Aiden. It's, also, it's great to be here. I'd say that you know, if you take a step back and you think about this great work from home experiment that we're all going through right now, even customers uh, that I talked to were just surprised at how rapidly we moved into this mode and how effective everybody has been. At Citrix, you know, we have talked about remote work and we build remote work infrastructure for the last 30 years. And so it's part of what we do but even in our case, we generally only had 10, 20% of our workforce remote at any one point in time. And so we saw this coming relatively early in the year, you know, back in the December, January timeframe, based on the experiences that we were having with our Chinese teams and our teams throughout uh, the APJ region. And so we stepped back and we did both uh, a, a number of drills internally to make sure our infrastructure was ready to burst to the kind of capacity that would require for all of us to be remote simultaneously but also step back and really build solutions for customers. Customers that I talk about as burst capacity so they could ramp really, uh, really effectively as quickly as possible. And we did that across the board. And so it's been, it's been a really, really interesting time. I'm incredibly proud of the team and the, the number of stories that I've, I've heard from customers about how we've just gone above and beyond to help them drive business continuity, whether that is a hospital ser uh, system serving patients, financial institutions, uh, schools and universities, it's just been, it's actually been phenomenal from that perspective. What is your ecosystem like now? I mean, this world has changed so much in the last few months. Can you describe for us between the internal teams and how you are working with partners? What has changed and what does it look like? Well, fortunately, a lot of our partners have been with us for our 30 year history. And, and you know, they have a, a deep, deep background in these ideas of remote work and remote work technologies. and all of the cultural aspects that need to evolve to be able to make this a fundamental part of the way people work. And so, you know, they were able to step right in in real time and help us, you know, just service as many customers as we could. So we, as I mentioned, we created uh, business continuity offerings and we used our partners to make sure we're reaching as many customers as possible. Around the globe, we service uh, roughly 400,000 medium and large scale enterprises. And so our reach is terrific, but I wanted to make sure we had the capacity to be able to service as many as possible. So it's been an ongoing dialogue. I'd say that from a business point of view, we've certainly been adjusting, you know, responding and reacting to you know, the environment as it's, uh, as it's evolved and the unique needs of customers. You've seen a lot of people that have gotten ahead of the digital transformation curve, and frankly, this was easy. I had a financial services CIO tell me just, uh, just the other day, that the investments that he had made over the last three years with both Citrix Cloud and, and Microsoft in this case, uh, now allowed him to take 75,000 people remote in three days. If they hadn't have done that, he doesn't have any idea how many weeks it would have taken to drive that level of productivity, that level of continuity. And so it's just showing uh, the, the power of flexible infrastructure, the power of remote work, and I think it's gonna be something that both Citrix and our partners are gonna be able to really drive and evangelize for, for many, many years to come. Now, I understand you've been spending a lot of time with customers and especially leaning into their challenges and the opportunities that are opening up for them as they are doing remote work in a new ways at scale, perhaps, you know, as in the example that you just shared. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing uh, really shifting in their outlooks around remote work. I mean, you gave this example of a company that did in three days something that perhaps they thought would take months or years to accomplish in the past. How are the mindsets of customers really changing as it comes to their outlook around remote work, both in the short term and are they thinking about this differently in the long term from what you're seeing and hearing? Aiden, that's really the fascinating part of this discussion. If you think about remote work, and there's a lot of people that have done studies on this, and you know, uh, two years ago, there was a study that was done by uh, one of the U.S. federal organizations that concluded that about 7% of organizations had some level of remote work policy, just 7%. Yeah. And that number went down pretty dramatically when you started to look at you know, more public sector type roles. And then all of a sudden you took 40% of the entire U.S. workforce, 
and you move them remote simultaneously, all at the same time, 40% of jobs. Uh, right now, that's delivering about 65% of all the economic output. And when I talk to customers, the first few weeks of the, the pandemic were fascinating because CEOs were surprised that people were productive. And there was a lot of discussion about why that is. You know, why have we been able to move people remotely and they're still being just as productive, in many cases more so, than they were previously? So that was kind of one area. CFOs took the position of, wow, if people are productive, why do I need all this real estate? Why am I traveling constantly around the globe? Why am I attending trade shows? It seems like I'm pretty productive in, in this new mode. So maybe there's a cost savings aspect here. And then you have uh, HR professionals that have, you know, in many cases, been the champion of remote work because they see it most clearly from a business perspective. The idea that talent exists everywhere in the world and the ability to tap into those talent pools you know, look for non-traditional workers in, in many areas and leverage that as part of a broader ecosystem can really drive business outcomes. So it's been fascinating. And I think a lot of that actually goes back to the old stigma that if people can't be seen, they must not be working. And so when you think about remote work, for a long time, people looked at that as work from home meant an additional day off instead of this is the reality that frankly, most people are not very productive in, a, in an office environment. Some studies that I've seen point to two, maybe two and a half hours a day of uninterrupted productive time in the workplace because of all the distractions, your coworkers, your commute, you know, moving back and forth from meetings. And so I think this has really opened up a lot of eyes into just the power of empowering people, frankly, engaging them in a way that allows them the space to be productive on their terms. And so going forward, the latest studies, uh, studies that we've done as part of our research arm, I've seen some from Stanford University, from PwC and others, that say that most organizations now, somewhere between 50 and 70 percent, depending on the study, are going to be embracing remote work as part of their overall infrastructure. And I think personally that'll land somewhere between one and two days per week will be the, uh, the more flexible part of that. But breaking through this stigma is, I think, a really big part of the challenge. So I'm great. it's great to see that. Are there some things that you feel that you've been doing as a leader, because I'm sure a lot of the folks listening right now are scrutinizing their own leadership practices and thinking about how they're leading, you know, not just now during this pandemic, but also what of their own practices they should be shaping and taking forward um, that will be enduring. Are there some examples you'd be willing to share of things around communication or other leadership approaches that you've found yourself doing in this moment or over the last few months that you would absolutely think um, will influence how you lead going forward in a more permanent way? I think it's a great question. And, and part of what I've realized about my own style and what I'm seeing in, in other organizations is that you know, moving into a pandemic, this is the first time that certainly I can remember that the entire globe was facing a similar kind of uh, challenge, an exterior challenge, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different when you have a localized you know, weather event or disruption. And so we have, you know, rethought communications globally. And so from a personal style, knowing the, the sheer nature and the unpredictability of the pandemic, you know, I've, I've really become much more, um, not much more, but I'd say, you know, more of a empathetic, human, down to earth, sometimes silly approach, you know. In the early days of the pandemic, I was putting out videos every week where it'd be a little bit of a, you know, a day in the life, maybe joke a little bit about, you know, mm -hmm. the pandemic and masks and PPE and just have a little bit of fun. And I think it's really critically important to recognize that we're all going through the same thing. Yeah. We have different individual challenges, but you know, we are all worried about our families. We're all worried about, you know, contracting a, a, a virus. We're worried about the economy, the company, our friends, our families, our customers. And just being able to have that common thread, I think is actually very soothing in some ways. And so, you know, my style morphed from, it's always been a little casual, but you know, much, much more casual than it's ever been, much more frequent. I'm out there, you know, constantly with updates every single week, videos mm -hmm. every week. You know, but not making it just business. You know, making it more personal, giving a glimpse inside of my life that I probably wouldn't have done naturally otherwise. And little things like being able to look around, you know, somebody's office. It stimulates a conversation about a painting in the background or, you know, something that, you know, uh, allows you to connect with people on a very, very different level. Yes. And so I'm actually very excited and the aspect that, you know, we're drawing our teams closer together. 
so we're learning more about each other than we ever have because we're glimpsing this bridge between our personal lives and our work persona as it was historically defined. And so, you know, as we go forward, I think that the, some of the learnings for me are, you know, continue to be a very, very empathetic style, very, very human style. You know, I've always been a, a lead by example. I would never, uh, you know, ask our teams to do anything that I wasn't already doing. And, you know, frankly, the hierarchy in its more traditional form is starting to dissolve anyway, mm -hmm. but it's been a great democratizing experience. And so as I look forward, a lot of the things I've talked about in terms of how do we set goals that really help align the organization, how do we focus more on outcomes and less on activities, and those types of things that you know, were, were obvious as we went through this, but now how do we put those into systems to reinforce those and make those more cultural than anything else? I think that's gonna be the, the great learning for me. Thank you for sharing some of those personal stories. I think those, those always are very powerful for us to hear. Um, all right, I wanna ask you a little bit more about um, organizations and, and the, really the future as we look ahead. So we've talked about, uh, you know, some companies are talking about the new normal and they're talking about like, what does the new normal look like? Within Upwork, we've been really having this mantra around back to better and this idea that we are preparing ourselves and really working towards designing a future that is about going forward into something that's better than what it was in the past and not about um, returning to the old ways, but embracing something um, new and different. And I'm curious, you know, what is Citrix appro Citrix's approach to back to better? Is it um, different? Is it uh, bringing together different threads of what you were doing and things you've been doing during this pandemic? Can you describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, first off, I, I love the idea of back to better. That sounds way better than, you know, back to normal, because, you know, I think we all agree that you know, we're not sure what normal was in the first place, and, and back to where we were isn't uh, a step forward. It's only about you know, where we've been. So you know, we're taking this opportunity, very similar to the way you're approaching it, to say, okay, what, you know, what have we learned through this period of time, and how do we want to evolve culture, systems, process, et cetera, to you know, be more aligned, more connected, more empathetic to customers, and really live um, our, our, our values and our brand proposition even more than we did in the past. And so we've stepped back and I've asked a, a big cross-functional organization to really create a, it starts with a listening tool, I'd say, and then, it, then, it, then it's gonna permeate into all of those different attributes that I just mentioned in terms of our systems, our policies, our practices, and more importantly, our norms, you know, based on what the outcomes that we wanna drive. So, you know, for people like me, you know, I've always been a on the road traveling or generally in the office. Remote work is what I did on nights and weekends. And so, you know, through this period of time though, I've recognized just how much more productive I am because I've got time to think, I've got time to prioritize, I have time to actually work on things that can be leveraged into more strategy policies that, that have a broader reach. And so, you know, we're going to be rethinking all aspects of remote work as kind of one bucket and everything that goes along with that more flexible work. So I'm, you know, I'm calling it hybrid work model and that's where I expect us to land. We're also taking a fresh look at you know, the types of travel that we've done historically. Now, I'm sure you're the same as I am where you spend most of your life traveling or at least 50% of the time. And now that you haven't been on the road for a few months, you step back and you realize, you know, it's probably a lot of that travel that I didn't need to do. I could do it just as effectively on a remote basis or be more discriminating with my time just to create the biggest leverage, the, the largest impact. So we're gonna be rethinking a lot of our internal travel. And that includes internal meetings, even large group meetings, to make sure that we have you know, clarity of purpose, clarity of outcomes, and we really think it through so it doesn't just become a habit. You know, a habit that you know, I travel to go to a QBR, so I must be able to keep doing that. And that'll be the, the second big thing. And then the third one is, really about how we engage and we reach out and spend time with our customers and partners. Like a lot of companies, we have historically done the large trade shows, the big customer conferences, and even those we're taking a big step back and thinking, you know, what are the problems we're truly trying to solve? Is this a training event? Is this a marketing event? Is this just a networking event? And then design things a little bit more purpose-built for those specific outcomes. And we're gonna be evolving a lot of these. And the, uh, the benefits of this time, if you wanna kind of put it in a positive light, is that it's forcing you to rethink 
a lot of traditional business processes and a lot of business activities and look at better ways to accomplish that, both through digital transformation, of course, but also fundamentally questioning the purpose. And so, you know, they, it's one of those areas I'm actually very excited about going forward. I think we're going to emerge as a much uh, more efficient and much more aligned organization than even going into this. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I, I've definitely been on a number of conversations with other um, CEOs and executives who said, can we just make a pact that we're not going to go back and do all of the travel or all of these um, in-person events that really, you know, as we've looked at it, there was no need to do these things in person. You know, these were getting just as much value or more doing it virtually because it's either democratized or we can actually, you know, have more customer conversations or, you know, touch more folks because we're not on the on the plane and, you know, doing all of the travel. So I really do think exactly. there is this great opportunity to reshape how we think about some of those things and get, you know, get better at that and not just fall into the trap of thinking face to face is better because sometimes it, it may not be. Absolutely. You know, I'd love to hear how you're approaching it. But from my perspective, I mean, the ability to just pop in on different groups around the, around the globe, you know, uh, via remote is fantastic. And it's a little hard to do, you know, happy hours early in the morning with a team on the other side of the planet. But it's, uh, it's great to be able to pop in and just, you know, engage with people on a relatively one on one basis. Might not be in person, but if it's one on one, it's, it's still, you know, highly effective. Uh, in areas that you might not have in the past because now you have the opportunity and frankly the the availability of your time to be able to do that. I've been talking a lot about the idea that work is not a place, it's actually a thing you do and that's something that at Upwork we've been espousing for many, many years. I'm curious, how do you think about um, ensuring workers can be productive on their own terms? Are there things that companies should be doing to really either listen to and understand worker needs or design policies and practices that specifically um, incorporate uh, the things that workers do need to be productive and that does you know vary from person to person or team to team by function how do you think about that and how should we be thinking about that in a world where we're kind of all now very focused on understanding and driving that productivity and tapping into you know the very needs that, that our workforces and our people have yeah, I think it's a it's a great question, and you know what a lot of companies have realized going into the the COVID pandemic period is that, you know, many people don't have a setup at home that is you know conducive to working and working you know constructively. It's one thing to be sitting on your bed with a small laptop if if it's at night and you're checking email, but if you're doing that uh, exclusively, I mean, it's a, it's a rough environment. One of the things that we did very early on was we gave everybody except leadership a bonus in the organization to go and build out your, your home environment um, in, in whatever way you need it. If you need a new chair, a stand-up desk, a big monitor, we wanted to make sure that people could be productive and start to remove some of those barriers that were controllable. We can't influence uh, childcare and some of the unique um, uh, issues that are that are showing themselves during the pandemic period, but we can at least give you the technology and the tools to be as productive as possible. So that's one. Second one is more you know back to what we deliver as an organization and the types of tools and services. So customers have used our capabilities for you know, 30 years really to deliver applications, all of their mission critical applications to people both inside and outside of their organizations, and we describe that more as organizing IT. There's a lot of complexity in a typical IT uh, data center. I sometimes describe it as like an archeological dig because there is layers upon layers of different technologies. So the things that we can do to simplify and organize that is a lot of our legacy. A few years ago, what we did is we said, well, let's bring all of these things that users need to be productive together. And that's why we created the Citrix workspace where it's really focused on what are the tools, the resources, the context you need to be productive and then make that portable across a number of different uh, devices. So you can work as you choose, any network, any location, any device. But really what's uh, the future is how do we help guide work? How do we simplify work by automating a lot of these typical tasks that we all end up doing removing those, automating those, or at least putting them in context so you can act on them quickly and move on. And then leveraging you know, AI, ML, and many other uh, forward-looking capabilities to be able to help predict work and make it you know, uh, more immersive and allow you, again, that space to succeed by removing all the digital noise and exhaust that exists in, in many roles right now. And so 
that's been you know, our, our thought process as we think about you know, what do we need to do to ensure that people are productive. And a lot of that is just not giving them the tools to be task workers. You pay people to be knowledge workers, but you give them the tools to really pull them back. And that's one of the reasons why engagement has been at this historical low level pre-pandemic. So you know, companies like Citrix and others are really looking to change that from a technology point of view. And then everything we talked about from a management standpoint and setting the right kind of outcomes and goals and alignment is going to be critical to back that up. Yeah, absolutely. I love that idea of the digital exhaust and the ways that we can create true environments for knowledge workers, not task workers, and, and really enabling people to have at their fingertips, you know, all of the things that you mentioned um, that really make people able to kind of fly through and do really creative and productive work, not be, you know, in the drudgery of like searching for that resource or like trying to find that tool or that document that they know has the thing that they need. Um, and that is Hayden, a I'll huge tell you, unlock. just on that point though, the, the statistics are staggering. I mean, right now the average person in an office environment spends one day a week looking for information, oh. trying to find that one file, that one that you're looking for. That's a day per week. At the same time, every two minutes we're interrupted by something, a tweet, a text, a notification, an email, every two minutes. And, and every study will show that it takes the average person about 20 minutes to get back to what they were doing right. in the first place. So when you start putting these things together, it's no surprise that you know, you've got a productivity problem and an engagement problem. You just need to give people the tools and the space for them to be successful on their own terms. And, you know, like I said earlier, I think that people, when unencumbered by these constraints, are going to accomplish some amazing things. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's so interesting that you hear those stats from you, David, and I think it really points to this issue, too, that I think employers may be so caught up thinking that they need to create the right office environment for people to be productive, but lo and behold, they've maybe been trying to solve completely the wrong problem which is much more about the digital experience, which is actually where workers are spending their time. I mean, they might be sitting in the office, but they're sitting in front of a computer screen. And that's where either they're highly productive or to your point, you know, getting a lot of interruptions from notifications and challenges around finding information, all of that. And so it really is putting in context, I think, where we should be spending time as employers and um, focusing on creating the productivity space, not in terms of necessarily the physical environment, I mean, although that is important, but really around that, that digital environment. That is the frontier for making sure that people really can be productive. And that is, you know, uh, that is the next challenge. And that is an area where obviously Citrix is doing so much work and has so many great um, tools and technology to bring to bear to, that, to solve that very problem. Couldn't agree more. It's, uh, it's a huge part of the equation. All right, so I wanna ask you a couple more questions, David. Um, one of them is around team organization. And I'm curious, as we think about a more distributed model and companies that are increasingly comfortable with remote workers, how do you see this potentially impacting the way companies think about organizing teams or structuring their organizations? Do you think that this is gonna have specific impacts on um, that thought process for uh, companies and, and team leaders? Yeah, I think uh, in a lot of ways it will. I mean, I'm, I belong to you know many CEO groups, and we have these conversations, uh, especially recently, about the you know the concentration of technology talent, for example, in areas like Silicon Valley and others, and the cost and and the complexity of real estate in those. And so, businesses of all shapes and sizes are looking for ways to expand out, to tap new new talent pools, and uh, and to you know, move outside the constraints of where they happen to have a physical office. And so we were seeing that wave starting to happen already. And I think this is just now proven that it can, it can be you know, on, on turbo. It's gonna accelerate dramatically at this point in time because you know, it's, it's, you know, it's challenging. Imagine right now in 280 and 101 in the Bay Area, the, the freeways are wide open. You can just sail right through them because everybody is working at home. So not just is it a benefit, as we've been talking about, to the individual to be able to have more flexibility and drive more productivity, but at the same time, you know, businesses are recognizing lower costs, the environment is uh, has seen benefits, traffic is down, and so I think it's a pretty holistic set of issues right now that you know, everybody is grappling with. And it all comes back to how do you engage people? How do you make them productive on a team basis so that you know, small groups, which are easier to align, really have a clarity and understanding of what are the outcomes we're trying to drive and how best do we accomplish those things. 
So I definitely see it uh, heading in that direction. But if you take a little bit of a step back, you know, the other thing that is a more of an environmental factor right now is, is what's going on around us from just the advancements in technology. You know, many of us talk about, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and advances in connectivity and data and, you know, quantum computing and all of these things that seemed like science fiction just a few years ago are quickly becoming a reality. And the output that it's going to have on many organizations is that this idea of using specialized information as a competitive differentiator is going to go away. The organizations that succeed in the future are those that are the most agile and that can get you know, that special information and put it at people's fingertips in real time, you know, when the business opportunity presents itself, because it won't be proprietary anymore. It's more how we interact with this huge volume of information that's being developed these days. So this level of flexibility, creativity, and people that can thrive in more you know, ambiguous models are the ones that are gonna truly succeed in the future. Now I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of challenge in many industries right now trying to think through how we make that most productive and most effective going forward. Yeah, and it would also suggest that a lot of companies are being kind of put to the test on that right now. I mean, our, our agility muscles are being kind of strained to the limit at this moment, and I think we're being um, tested and kind of forced to really develop those muscles if we didn't have them or kind of, you know, use them if they were uh, atrophying. Uh, but certainly, I think to your point, this is, this is going to be this level of agility and flexibility. I mean, certainly even, you know, once the pandemic subsides, like, there is an aspect of just the, the business requirements around that adaptiveness that is part of the future going forward and that isn't going to go away and that becomes you know a huge competitive differentiator for businesses. So completely Absolutely. resonates. Absolutely. Um, and something that I think we all should be thinking about in terms of how do we leverage the lessons of this pandemic and what they showed us in terms of our strengths and our gaps in terms of being adaptable and agile. Um, but then really channel those lessons into building, you know, strengths that will carry us forward even once the pandemic um, subsides because those are competitive differentiators for us. Absolutely. Um, so let me ask you about a very broad question around the future. What do you think the future of remote work does look like from your perspective? From my perspective, and part of this is my hope, is that we drop the term remote and we think about it more as work. Work is, as you said, it's not a place. Work is about productivity. It's about outcomes. It's about deliverables. And the, the idea that work can happen anywhere, across, of course, any device in any location, we need to put those things into practice. You know, the good news is most organizations are starting to realize this. The future is going to be hybrid, where we leverage our physical infrastructure, our office buildings, if you will, to focus on those things that are best performed in person. And I think we know what those are, certain types of collaboration, observing and, and you know, experiencing the norms that build culture, and many of those uh, types of things that are just frankly hard to do remote. But then giving people the space to succeed and allowing them to drive outcomes you know, without having to worry about the daily commute, the, the back and the forth, and all the things that we've talked about that have made the office environment less productive than we would imagine it to be. So I think you know, you're, you're gonna find that you know, more than half of organizations will embrace this idea of hybrid. And everything that goes with that that we've talked about, whether it's the management systems, the expectation and goal setting, the technology infrastructure, those will need to come together to make sure that it's, um, th that it's truly effective. And then culture. Culture obviously needs to be the number one thing. The antiquated models of the past of being able to count heads and you know, reward the people that spend the most time, you know, virtually chained to an office, that has to change. And I think it, it's absolutely changing right now, but, you know, this pandemic has really opened up a lot of people's minds. And so, you know, I would expect that to really be the future of work. And then, you know, with tools like the ones that we provide and others, to be able to take that idea and remove all the digital noise and the exhaust to allow people to be more focused, more productive, more engaged on what, you know, Frankly, we, you know, we hire them to do, you know, in just about every organization, people are by definition the most valuable resource. By definition meaning, you know, more than half the expense. And so therefore, we need to make sure we're giving people the tools and the capabilities and the support to really drive the level of outcomes that, that we expect as business leaders 
but also that people need to be engaged, to be inspired, to be productive, and do their best work. So I think there's a huge win-win here. We just have to make sure we're knocking down some of the historical biases and supporting it with where the future should go. Awesome. David, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I can say three huge things I took away from it. Number one, hybrid. I'm so with you on that. The future is hybrid. It's not about some binary choice, but on every dimension, as you outlined, companies can be thinking about what that hybrid looks like for them. I think a second thing you said today was about culture and how we can all be leaning into what our cultural expectations and beliefs and changes need to be to really embrace a hybrid world that we are in and, and going to be increasingly in going forward. And I think the third thing you highlighted that's really powerful is this idea of solving for our digital environment and moving away from focusing on the workplace as a physical reality, but really how do we set up workers and teams to be productive in the digital environment, which is frankly where they have already existed as knowledge workers for many years. And that environment has been cluttered and unproductive for them in many ways that, that we really need to be solving. And there are incredible tools, including Citrix's, to really come to bear on that challenge. So three big takeaways that I had from this conversation um, and so many more. So thank you very much for your time and for sharing these thoughts with us today. It was fantastic to dive into the future of work and what's ahead for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great conversation. It's obviously something I'm, I'm super passionate about. So love to talk about it and uh, love to follow up with you anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Thank you.